you know, I still say that the biggest problem that we all have is obscurity. Those people that you could help with your product, with your service, they gladly pay you money. The only problem is they don't know you exist. So for me, the easiest way to create content is just have people ask me questions. There was a great book out there called They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. You think about it, that's what we're doing here. You ask me a question, I answer. So think about what's the easiest way for you to create it and then use technology and other people in order to repurpose it. As the store owner, I'm not sure if you should be the hero of the story. The person that buys the e-commerce stuff, they should be the hero of the story. In this noisy digital world, you can't break through the noise, you can just add to it. Instead, you need to get in on the conversation where your ideal customers are already listening. As a Navy veteran who runs nuclear power plants and an inbound marketing engineer, Tom Schweb has a refreshingly unique approach. He focuses on time-proven strategy, then supercharges it with today's technology and podcast interview marketing. An author, speaker, and teacher, Tom helps you get more traffic, leads, and raving customer fans by being interviewed on targeted podcasts. In this conversation, we cover different topics about podcasting and how to be a better guest, what tools you can use in order to get more interviews, the importance of storytelling, trends in the podcast world, and much more. Welcome to the Ecom X Factor podcast, where it's all about launching and scaling your business using sales funnels, automations, and smart marketing. And now, please welcome your host, the founder of Ecom X Factor, Yaron Bin. Hi, Tom. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Great. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I have a lot of questions in mind, so I hope you're prepared. E-commerce is near and dear to my heart. And I think e-commerce, you learn things so much quicker and can execute them so much quicker than other digital marketing. So I'm excited for the conversation also. So can you give the listeners a short background about Interview Valet and your background and what you're doing these days? I guess overarching, I believe that we're all, obscurity is our biggest problem, right? There's thousands, millions of people that would love to buy from you right now. The only problem is they don't know you exist. And I've spent lots of years trying to break through the noise and realize that I was just adding to the noise. So I really believe the best way is to get in on the conversations that people are already listening to, you know, leverage other people's audiences. And that's what I did as a digital marketer with one of the first e-commerce stores that HubSpot was on the HubSpot platform. Uh, we were the first case study and took what I learned there and really uh, put it podcast interview. Uh, back in 2014, I hypothesized, I wonder if you could use podcast interviews like we used to use guest blogs, right? Tap into other people's audience, started to do it. And it's worked well for authors, speakers, coaches, brands, and even some e-commerce brands that are built on relationships and lifetime value. Do you have any example that comes to mind? I can think of one. So this lady was selling to Christian audiences. She was selling nativity sets. You know, how do you break into that? Well, it's such a visual medium, right? Because they didn't know what they were and they had the stories that went with it. And it wasn't a something that anybody was searching for on Amazon at the time. So she went out there and thought, I need to get this story out there. So she started to talk about it probably like in the third quarter to get out there. People started to pre-order it. And then she found out that, you know, one of the great things was people were buying it as gifts. You know, it wasn't parents that were buying it. It was like grandparents that were buying it. And she mm -hmm. had so much success through that. She came back and said, I need to have one of these for like another time of the year too. So she started like an Easter one. And it was really interesting how she feedback that she got from the podcast interviews. Interesting. For me, I kind of feel that many e-commerce store owners are overlooking content in general. Do you agree with this hypothesis? I think content can be tough. I've written a lot of blogs in my life and everyone felt like a homework assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet my first company that uh, we had, it was a direct-to-patient durable medical equipment rental at, at one of the inbound conferences. I think it was, oh, inbound 2012 or something. It's voted the second unsexiest thing to sell on the internet. We came in two behind industrial lubricants. Okay. But that's how everybody found us, right? Mm -hmm. They found us through the content. And now I always look at it and say, 
I'd rather make this content talking, right? What we're doing now, and then repurpose that into blogs, social media posts, because especially as you get higher ticket items or something that is catching people more top of the funnel, where there's got to be some education with it. I, I've just found that you need, you need something besides, you know, a quick little Facebook post on that. People have to start to know, like, and trust it. And if you can differentiate it with who you are uh, and give them a sense there, and the only thing that's going to do that is really content. Hard for me to do that off of the best picture. Many store owners, they don't want to put themselves out there probably. And they prefer like doubling down on direct response and like immediate result. So can you share a bit about like how to handle this objection and how maybe to get started, maybe like building like your uh, spreadsheet, like media kit, stuff like that, how to get going as a beginning, like a store owner and that wants to start creating content. I would say as the store owner, I'm not sure if you should be the hero of the story. The person that buys the e-commerce stuff, they should be the hero of the story. Mm-hmm. So like when we were selling crutch alternatives, you know, nobody cares about me. They wanted to see somebody that was like them, you know, so there'd be a story about a mom that was trying to take care of her kids or, you know, a student trying to go not miss a semester of school. And how can you carry books and do all of this while you're on crutches? So trying to make them the hero of that. And to me, that's a lot easier Mm-hmm. is to make other people the hero of the story because then you've almost they they're doing the content for you right mm-hmm. you can ask them what their story is get them on a quick video Video like this, have them do a testimonial, and you can pick those stories out and reuse those. And I always say, you know, our customers are our best copywriters. Mm-hmm. I'm not a good copywriter, but I can never, I'll never forget the time I was talking with a customer and he's like, you know, I love inter- using interview valet because you let me be the guest and you take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. I couldn't... It, I couldn't write that down quickly enough. I'm like, oh, that's good copy. Uh, That's going to be our tagline. Okay. And so, so let's maybe zoom out because I, I, I like this train of thought. Uh, It kind of flipped what I thought at the beginning. Um, how would we, how would you suggest strategizing this? Because it's, is it different than just gathering testimonials or should the, like the store owners think about creating his own show while he's interviewing people uh, like as if it was a podcast on a weekly basis? So how would you build this? I think the first question on that is, what's the easiest way for me to make content? Mm-hmm. You know, if you're a natural writer, then, you know, have, write, write the blogs, put that content out there. But there's a lot of problems in the world today, but there's no better time to be alive because you can create in the way that's easiest for you mm-hmm. and then repurpose in the way that's easiest for other people. So, you know, if you're, if you're writing, well, you could write that and then have somebody else make it into uh, an audio, or you could take that writing and have somebody do like a a video, like an explainer video Mm -hmm. with all of that. For me, the easiest way to create content is just have people ask me questions. There was a great book out there called They Ask You Answer by Marcus Sheridan. Think about it. That's what we're doing here. You ask me a question, I answer. So think Mm -hmm. about what's the easiest way for you to create it. And then use technology and other people in order to repurpose it. So, you know, you could, there's free things online right now. Fireflies.ai, record something and transcribe it right away, basically for free. Okay, now you can take that and put it up as content or maybe clean it up. Uh, We've done it before where we'll hire a journalism major from a local university or college because they're so used to telling stories and writing, you know, 600 to 1,000 word stories. And, you know, they think they're writing newspaper stories. In essence, they're writing they're writing blog articles. And then take that and say, okay, what can we cut up in here and put it on a social media post? What clip can we put on there? Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's really being the creativity around it of creating the way that's easiest for you and then using technology and other people to repurpose it so it's easy for other people. To- mm-hmm. Awesome. Can you share a bit more, uh, like some more tools that you're using? Because for me, I use Otter AI for transcription, which is amazing, but it costs like nine bucks per month. But uh, I'm wondering what other tools can you can you suggest? Oh, there there are so many out there, and you can like Rev.com. I think still charges a dollar a minute to transcribe, and I'm like, I can't believe anyone would do that. YouTube will transcribe it for free up there. Now you get what you pay for, so mm-hmm. like. Otter, yeah, it's $10 a month and they do a great job. And most all of those like fireflies.ai, Otter, 
they usually have a, a free package. Mm-hmm. So if you're just trying to get some content, use three or four different free packages and mm-hmm. just use up your minutes in there. And it's amazing now with the gig economy going to Fiverr or something like that, you'd be amazed how many people you can take that will take an interview you do and transcribe it, make uh, blogs out of it, uh, mm-hmm. all kinds of things. I mean, there's people, you look at uh, Tim Ferriss did an entire book out of his podcast interview where they just took the content from it. This is a, this is blows my mind because basically his last two books, like Tribe of Mentors and Tools of Titans, is just an expert roundup. Basically, he just took all all the content from his episodes and just pushed it in, like curated it into books, and it became bestsellers, which is amazing. Uh, there's another one out there called Creative Careers with uh, Jeff Madoff. Mm-hmm. No relation. Not to be and, yeah, not to be confused. Yeah, not to be con- not to be confused. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Jeff, um, he, he's he, he's a creative. He used to do all of the uh, uh, the videos for Ralph Lauren. He did the Victoria's Secrets um, shows and everything like that. Very very eclectic man in New York City, and he knew all these people. So he started to teach at Parsons School of Design, and his entire class was called Creative Careers. And he'd basically call up all of his friends in, you know, Damon Johns from Shark Tank. And he just interview them about what their jobs were like. Well, he had so many of these that he turned it into a book. The book is awesome. Mm-hmm. And now he's turned it into a podcast. And he's basically just taking the, the audio from those interviews and making podcasts out of it. So a lot of people would say, well, it's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard to do. If you don't do it the way that comes naturally to you, it will be very, very hard. But if you can figure out what way comes naturally to you, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, I totally agree about this because like for me, I tried, we try to create that Ecomax Factor different formats. And for me, definitely, I, I agree that Creating audio makes the most sense and then repurposing because we also try to do like slides and maybe infographics and maybe blog posts. But for me, it's also the easiest is to speak and just create the transcription afterwards. Like you mentioned, for me, creating a blog post, writing down is like almost like a nightmare. So definitely <laughs> stick for the path of least resistance. And some people will say, should I, you know, should I be a podcast guest or a podcast host. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, that's like asking, well, should I be an Uber driver or an Uber passenger? Well, it's the same platform, but there's different goals to each one, right? So if you want to go out and get new followers, new backlinks, uh, new social media, then you go out on somebody else's platform and be a guest. If you're trying to nurture your current audience, your current customer, then that's a great way to have your own podcast. So I really don't think it's an either or. It's really what are your goals? What are you trying to do? I agree. What misconceptions or hidden benefits do you find in each one of them being a guest and being a host? What are like maybe (laughs) meta skills or values that people might uh, overlook? I I think the first one is the level of commit. Mm -hmm. I've been a guest on over 1,200 podcast interviews. And people say, well, do you have a podcast or when are you going to start your podcast? And I'm like, no, you know, I know how hard of work it is, right? Anybody that says doing a podcast is easy has either never done it or never done it well, because you don't see all the work that goes into it, nor do you see the level of commitment, right? Most podcasts that die, die within the first 10 episodes. And Mm -hmm. people will talk about, you know, there's 2 million podcasts out there. That's It's true, but the dirty little secret is the less than a half million have actually published in the last 30 days. So a lot of times it's really easy and they'll be like, oh, I want to start my own podcast. And you tell everybody about it. And then, you know, 90 days later, people circle back and say, well, Tom, how's your podcast going? Um, I canceled it, right? And it, it can become an embarrassment there. Whereas one of the things I like about leveraging other people's platforms is that you can do it when you want, right? We have a lot of clients that, you know, their busy time is Q4. They don't want to do interviews. That's when they're making money is in Q4. Mm -hmm. Other people will say, no, I'm on holiday in August. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. That's Mm -hmm. fine. Do your interviews before or after. Whereas a podcast host, especially if you're doing something that's like current events, Mm -hmm. sorry, there's no, there's no vacation. You've got to show up. People are expecting Uh that. It allows you more flexibility to be a guest. This is what you're saying, basically, in a way. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I haven't been a guest on too many podcasts, but I definitely think that it it makes a lot of sense to be a guest because of the backlinks and also the flexibility and also 
almost no cost involved. While when you're a host, there are a lot of costs involved, the, the editing, production, everything costs money. I'll never forget early on in our business. So we started 2015. It was probably about, I don't know, 2018. All of a sudden, our leads in one day just spiked. I mean, we got more leads in a day than we usually get in a month. Uh-huh. And so I started to, you know, when I get on the phone with the people, I'd ask them because nowhere on our form, dude, it was, how did you find out about us? Mm-hmm. And I started to ask it to a person. Everyone said, oh yeah, Neil Patel was talking about it mm-hmm. on his podcast on a great way to build backlinks. So he mentioned your company, uh, Interview Valet. So that's, I came over here and it's mm-hmm. like, we've got some clients that do it just for the backlinks. And, yeah. you know, you'd ask them, hey, do you want to be on, you know, Tim Ferriss's podcast and get heard by 2 million people? Or do you want to be on, you know, the Harvard Business Undergraduate Podcast heard by 200 people? And uh-huh. they're like, oh, give me the backlink from like harvard.edu. <laughs> Because to them, that's more, more valuable than getting heard on, you know, some you know, popular podcast. Amazing. I wanted to ask you, it's, it's a bit, might be a bit off topic, but uh, for me, it's intriguing. So maybe if you can share like the top three, most like the best questions or most surprising questions that uh, anybody asks you during these interviews, because you've, you've made so many. So oh, I, I was going to say, most of them are the same. Right. Uh-huh. And so it's very important not to sound like, oh, you're just reading off of, of those. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the ones that are the most interesting to me is mm-hmm. where do you see this going? Because mm-hmm. that's interesting, right? Not, not talking about the history of what was because mm-hmm. nobody really cares about that, but what does it for going forward? The other thing is that you've got to remember that as you get called or you get invited into a party, mm-hmm. you're the last person at that party, right? So you and all your listeners, they know each other, right? They know the inside jokes where you are and th- different things you say. Um, so I always tell our clients and we always prep them for every interview because uh, one of my thoughts is that only kids and clowns like surprises. We don't work <laughs> with either one, right? And so the hardest question by far that I have ever been asked on a podcast is Beyond the Rut podcast. They started to ask everybody, what's your favorite Renee Zellweger? And it was, you know, it, it was an inside joke that they had. And, you know, six months before they started to ask every guest that. And so, you know, we prep all of our clients. I'm a client too. So I've got this brief sheet and it says, you know, common question. And I'm thinking this, Renee Zellweger, you know, what, um, I know the name, but hey, I'm, I'm a 45 year old guy. If I knew that off the top of my head, that might be a little bit creepy. So I, you know, I Google her name and I'm like, oh yeah, she was a Jerry Maguire. I love that movie, right? Mm-hmm. So they get to that question. And I'm like, oh, show me the money, you know, Jerry Maguire, how <laughs> that's the best movie ever. And they laughed and stuff. Now, if they would have gotten to that question mm-hmm. and I would have gone, um, um, who, you know, everybody would have understand, but it would have, would have yelled was I've never a podcast before in my life. And I can think of like, uh, John Lee Dumas, uh, from entrepreneur on fire. Great podcast. When he was doing his daily one, he would always ask people, Hey, if you woke up in a alternate universe, all your food and housing was taken care of, you had $2,000, what would you do with it? You would still hear people go, huh, you know, I've never thought about that. And it's just like yelling to the audience that, you know, I'm a carpetbagger. I've never listened to this show. I, I have no idea. So I think from that standpoint, you know, it's like going to any other party, uh-huh. make sure you know what audience you're going to, you know, don't be surprised if when you're the last one. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. And it, it actually reminds me of, uh, I think I saw, I saw a few months ago, uh, politics related, and I don't like talking about politics, but uh, it was in the Israeli news and the woman interviewed like the news reporter, she interviewed Netanyahu and Netanyahu is a master of, of public speaking. And it was amazing to see that whatever she asked, he deflected the question and answered whatever he wanted to answer. <laughs> So this is also an important skill, which I'm wondering if you're prepping your guest about like, if she hits the fan and you don't know how to answer, do they have like a default question answer that they go to? Yes. And one of the biggest things with that, and we learned this years ago, we had a, a gentleman that uh, was a news commentator on one of the big US news stations, you know, national news. And it was just before the presidential election. Mm-hmm. And everybody wanted to ask him the prediction of, On the election, and he's like, "This is a no win solution, right? Because if you make a prediction like that, um you're either going to be right 
and everybody's going to think, oh, you know, they everybody knew that, right? And if you're wrong, everybody's going to go, what an idiot. He didn't see that coming. So like with even early on with, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, we told, we advised our mm-hmm. clients, you know, don't, don't call it COVID. Don't call it, you know, Corona, just call it the pandemic. Because all of a sudden, if, if you start calling it something and the name changes, well, three months from now, you're going to hear that and go, oh, that sounds wrong. Mm-hmm. Or even now, sometimes I'll hear people talk about, uh, I'll listen to an old podcast interview and they're like, you know, this is going to be tough, but when this is all over, you know, uh, come Easter, come springtime, the world's going to look new. And it's like, oh, you know, if you only knew, yeah, no, when, yeah. when you were talking about this in March, it wasn't going to be over by April and it almost mm-hmm. makes them look silly. So one of the ways that we teach people to deflect that is to make it timely, but timeless. So if you ask me, you know, a prediction, how many podcasts do you think they're going to be by the end of the year? I I don't know, right? But who's ever listening to it at the end of the year will be able to look that up and say, was he right or wrong? Uh We always say, say, reframe that. Like, I think that's a great question, but I think the bigger and the more important question Mm -hmm. is this, because no matter when you're listening to it, this is important, right? There's that whole thing of, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, there is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can think of one of our uh, clients was a financial advisor and somebody asked him, you know, so Ron, do you have any uh, Do you have any uh, stock tips? You know, what stock would you buy today? Well, by the time you say that, now it's recorded. And, you know, what, two weeks, maybe two months later, it goes live, a stock tip. That's a joke. And, you know, so he changed that. And he says, well, I think, that, you know, the more important question is whatever I say today, by the time you hear it, it's going to be old news. And so look at the the timely things, you know, what big things can you look at? You know, even like with the, the pandemic, if there's one thing that's for sure in the human condition is that... We're either going into a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or in a crisis, right? <laughs> so if you just talk about, you know, the current crisis or, you know, the current struggle in your business or the, the current challenge you're going through, people will connect the dots on that. I mean, mm-hmm. we've even seen that. We also advise people, don't talk about holidays, don't talk about seasons, don't talk about weather, right? Mm-hmm. Because if all of a sudden I'm like, wow, you know, how are you doing? Well, it sure is hot here in Michigan and, uh, you know, um, all the rest of this summer is is tough. Well, what if there's a six month lag between now and when it goes live? As soon as somebody hears it, they're going to go, oh, this sounds really old. Or Mm -hmm. somebody's going to be in Australia listening to it and it's their winter. So it could, it could be, you know, two days old and they'd still go, oh, it sounds like it's old. So trying to make things timely, but timeless. Quick favor, guys. If you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time now, we would really, really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your preferred podcast app may be. Having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms. And it also supports our mission of helping as many people as possible to become better marketers and better entrepreneurs. So if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, Pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over your podcast app. And we will love you even more than we already do. Thank you for taking the time and I hope you enjoyed the show. I love this principle. And I was wondering, does Interview Valet, do you have like an aggregation of all these principles? How do you come up with these <laughs> principles? Um uh, or is it like based on like rhetorical books that you, books about rhetorical or did you read like a lot of Aristo stuff or how, how do you come up with these principles and do you aggregate them? Uh, yes. And that thank you for asking that because I got to pull it up myself. Um, one of my favorite phrases is mm-hmm. what's ordinary to you is amazing to others. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, trying to learn from other people, I think, is amazing. And, you know, we've been doing this now for over seven years, over 700 clients, over 30,000 interviews, Mm -hmm. and we should learn from each other, right? It's okay to make a mistake, but to make a mistake twice is stupid. And to make it three times, it's almost like you're a sadist at that point, right? So we always share what we know. In fact, I'll put, there's a checklist that we give all of our clients 
that says, hey, here's here's the basics of things. And if people want a copy of that, uh, I'll just put it up at interviewvalet.com forward slash ecom X factor. Uh, awesome. There's also a, uh, a web uh, page where I've just got little videos called mm-hmm. Podcast Guest Profits Tip of the Day. It's mm-hmm. just interviewvalet.com forward slash tip, T-I-P. And, you know, it's just all of a sudden I'll learn something. I just want to put it out there with other people. Uh, You know, most of them I would say are common sense, but once you figure out, you know, it's common sense until you uh, haven't heard of it before. It is saying common sense isn't common. And I kind of agree. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately. Um, all, do all the guests that come to interview Valet, do they have a certain level of self-confidence or public speaking background? I assume that, that they don't, but how do you handle this? They don't. And that's mm-hmm. very interesting. We did a survey years back mm-hmm. and we found this, now granted, this was pre-COVID, that most of the people that we worked with were introverts mm-hmm. or self-described as introverts. So if you ask them, you know, uh, hey, do you want to get up in front of this stage and talk with a thousand people? They would like, no, I don't want to do that. But they felt very comfortable just talking over Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're more comfortable with that. And in some ways, I think those people that are trained speakers, we had to work with to say podcasts are different. Uh, like, for example, that gentleman that I mentioned that was a you know a national newscaster, He most of his pieces were four minutes long on the national news. And so with that, that meant the the host was probably speaking for a minute or two, and he spoke in a minute or two. This person, Morgan, was tighter than anyone I had ever seen on his answers. He could get a clear, concise answer, but he wouldn't tell stories. Mm-hmm. And that was painful on a podcast, right? We've got a 30-minute podcast, and if every answer is a 30 to 45-second answer, that becomes really, really p- painful for the audience, but also for the host. Uh, so we had to tell him a little bit to to stretch it out a little bit more. There's been other ones where we've had to teach them. And uh, we uh, I, I've learned so much from clients. We worked with a gentleman called Arthur Joseph. Uh-huh. Nobody knows Arthur Joseph. He's this probably 70-year-old man. He's the speech coach for the National Football League in the United States. And he, he writes most of the Hall of Fame speeches. He coaches these people. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he pointed out and that I teach to all of our clients is at the end of a podcast interview, you'll, you'll hear this where people say, well, hey, Ron, uh, how can people get in touch with you? And people feel like they've got you know two seconds to get everything done. They speed up. They put it all in there. This is not like radio or television. You know, If you don't get it in, in two minutes or probably 30 seconds on radio, mm-hmm. it's going to get cut off because, hey, we're going to news and weather on the fives. Whereas podcasts, you've got time to slow down. And the other thing too, is that uh, we found a lot of speakers that talk really, really fast. That can be very good on television where you can see somebody, but 70% of podcasts are listened to sped up. So if all of a sudden you're talking really, really fast and then they speed you up, they're never going to hear you. Or (laughs) here's a funny story. Early on, probably six months into our company, I had a buddy of mine said, why did you call the company Interview Ballet? And I'm like, no, it's Interview Ballet with a V. I said, Interview Ballet, that's stupid. And he's like, yeah, I thought so too. I'm like, why did you think it was called that? And he said, well, you said it so quickly that that's what I heard. And it's almost like, have you ever had a, a song where you heard the song lyrics wrong the first time and you keep singing them in your head that way even after somebody corrects you you're like no i don't think that's the way it is right (laughs) well it was the same thing and i was thinking if if this friend of mine doesn't know the name of my company how many people are going to know it when i throw that in at the end of the um, podcast interview i talk fast they're listening to it fast they'll never find Uh, this reminds me of something that i saw and i'll connect it to a question that i have in a moment Uh, in one of the podcasts that I, I listened to, the guest said at the end, he didn't do like all the, where can you find me? He just said, you can Google my name. And I loved it because it was the honest and authentic way. And I said, yeah, everybody's just at the end, they're over promoting and dropping link and doing like shame, shameless plugs. And so this is, this is an authentic way of doing, doing it in my opinion. But on the other hand, some people might be too authentic. So how do you handle this? On one hand, you 
everything you say has to have a purpose of conveying the message and being aligned with what you want to convey. But on the other hand, you also want to be authentic. So how, how, do, you, how do you handle this? I, I would look at that as trying to help people, mm -hmm. right? Um, how can you help them get more information? Mm -hmm. So if the person's name that was doing that is David Meerman Scott, great mm -hmm. author, right? Um, sure, I can Google David Meerman Scott and find him. Um, I could probably even do David Meerman or Meerman Scott, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But if his name is David Scott, no, no, you know, I'm setting people up um, to try to find which one they're talking about. The other thing, too, is I think it's important to send them to a place where they're going to get the right information, mm -hmm. right? So when I said before, hey, I'll make a special page and put that up, because we're recording this now in 2021. Mm -hmm. If I say, hey, just go to the, um, the, the website and it's on the front page there and you can get it there. Well, if somebody listens to it in 2022, I guarantee you the homepage is going to look different. Yeah. And I want to make sure that they get the right stuff. So if you're doing a um, evergreen content, mm -hmm. it should go to an evergreen page. Uh, the other thing that we have found is that when you send somebody to a page off of a podcast interview, don't make it a squeeze page, right? Put the navigation in there. For God's sake, if, if they want to look around your website because they've heard you for 30 or 45 minutes, let them do that. Um, the other thing that I see people doing is um, they'll say, you can find me here on Instagram. You can find me here on Twitter. Uh, you know, here I am on TikTok. Well, remember, most people are listening sped up. They're multitasking while they do it. So they're not going to write all those things down. You'll just confuse them. I mean, there are times where I'll just say, you know, find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Tom Schwab in all of Kalamazoo. Right. So there I just sort of told them, oh, yeah, you know, there's multiple Tom Schwabs. But if you look at the one that uh, is in Kalamazoo, you'll find me there. So sometimes like that, just making something fun of it can help. Nice. And this, this is a great tip to stand out as a, as a guest. So do, do you have more tips like this or like how to be like not as I mean, to stand out as a guest, to be honest. I learned this from a, a speech coach. A uh, guy's name is Pat Quinn out mm -hmm. of Milwaukee. And he always talks about, you know, at the end, don't just give your pitch, right? Don't say, hey, come back and sign up and buy this and do that. You know, uh, end it with something that's, uh, you know, helpful to people or, or, or connects with them. All right. So so it's not just ends on a on a pitch there. Mm. And I've seen it done live and I've seen it done on podcast interviews. And it, it works out really, really well because it's a conversation. And if we were having a conversation, you know, sitting down over a cup of coffee and there was like this hard pitch at the end, it would just be creepy. I agree. It would be creepy. So finishing finishing the podcast, not with the pitch but providing value. And this is something that you're um, speaking about a lot, uh, uh, creating evergreen content and also providing value and being helpful, which, which I love. Um, I wanted to, to ask you this, you mentioned this before. So what are the trends that you're seeing or assuming uh, that we'll see in the next upcoming years in regards to, to content creation, uh, podcasting, maybe shorter, maybe longer. A lot of people are saying that on one hand, the attention span is getting longer on the other uh, because people are listening to long form podcasts like Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, etc. But on the other hand, people are saying that our attention span is very short. So in general, what are the trends that you're assuming that we'll see? I think we're going to see a, a few things here. And you can look at what we're doing right now, what's working and what isn't. So long form content conversations. That's all the clubhouse is, right? So they have proven that long form works. Mm -hmm. There's a place for it, but not everything will be long form. You've got something like TikTok, which is, you know, short form content at its best, right? So I think the best people will be doing both, right? So you see some podcasters doing this now where they do one long episode a week, and then they might do a couple of small episodes where they're just talking about one thing. I've seen Christopher Lockhead uh, from Lockhead on Marketing do that. Mm -hmm. Other times, they may take a long-form piece of content and take some key things out of it and make standalone podcasts for that mm -hmm. because not everybody is going to read you know, the 500-page book. So just take out the 20 pages and make that a separate book. Um, I see that in there. The other one that I've struggled with for probably the better part of a year since I saw this. And the more I saw it and thought about it, I'm like, this gentleman is right. There's a um, book by Joe Hansen. He's out of Stanford. He's a futurist. Mm -hmm. And he, he's got a book called The Leadership Literacies um, and for the Future. 
And one of the things he said is that the future is vivid audio, not vivid video. And I think that's different than most people think. And at first I thought, no, that can't be right. But the more I thought about it, it, it's true. And I think we might have seen a blip during COVID when everybody had extra time to watch video. But by and large, people don't have time to watch video. The other thing is that video becomes very dated very quickly and very judgmental very quickly. So uh, I I think of my uh, niece was going back and getting her real estate license and she was listening to some old Zig Ziglar mm-hmm. and she called me up and she's like, Uncle Tom, have, have you ever heard of Zig Ziglar? This stuff is great. You would love it. And I didn't have the, the guts to tell her, honey, Zig's been dead for years. And that was probably recorded before you were even born. You know, if she was watching him with, you know, huge lapels and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. some funny 70s hairdo or something like that. She never would have listened to that. She would have laughed at it. Uh Um, But no, she listened to the content. So I think um, one of the things that I'm seeing is that there's a place for short form content, long form content. uh, But I don't think video is going to be as big as everybody says Mm -hmm. because they don't have the time to watch it. It's Mm -hmm. harder to create and it has a much uh, much shorter expiration date. And I, 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 I never thought about the fact that people are less judgmental towards audio and this is what gives it an, an edge of a video. And I, I love this uh, point because it's, uh, I totally agree. Um, another question that I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts regarding monetization and, and ads in podcast and paying to be a guest or charging to, to have guests? So money, money, money issues in regards to in the podcast industry. Yeah, and it's it's interesting where it's going with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's some very big people that have been trying to monetize it mm-hmm. um, through uh, through placement fees, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I still believe, and this is this is the United States. Um, I've heard lawyers at Podcast Movement and other conferences say that charging for a for an interview if you don't fully disclose it in the United States is illegal. So there was a article called Direct to Creator. Uh, It came out of a a newsletter called Category Pirates with Christopher Lockhead and Eddie Yoon. And they really talked about a new model where people are going to go and uh, pay the creator directly. And you can see this in a lot of different models that are starting to pop up. There's one for authors. that works off Bitcoin and blockchain. There's some different newsletters where people are just saying, hey, I'm just gonna put it up on the newsletter and you you can get all of this content for whatever it is, $10 uh, a year. And the thing is, is that the creator is getting the vast, vast majority of that. And I think we're gonna start seeing that more and more now uh, in music, in literature. And I think it'll even come into podcasts too, where they're gonna start taking the middleman out because I think it's a long, long way to go uh, to try to monetize a podcast off of um, audible ads. You know, uh, you gotta, what is it? I think right now it's about oh, 25 or $30 do- per thousand downloads. Mm-hmm. And you figure, you know, um, Top 1% of podcasts get 34,000 downloads per episode. So you're going to say, well, for a, a top, you know, uh, top uh, 1% podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Audible will t- will um, will give you, what is that, $1,000 per episode. That's a lot of work to get there just for that. So I think there's different ways. Um, and I check out that direct to creator um, business model. I think that's really something that's coming down. Interesting. And uh, yeah, like platforms like Patreon in a way, or is it, or the fact that Patreon is in the way, uh, it's not exactly direct to creator. What do you think about Patreon, for example? Uh, I think Patreon is probably the first step with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we're going to see it go further and further with that. Um, Mm -hmm. Right now, it was interesting. In in the US, um, especially, we were used to free content everything's free, everything's free. And you're starting to see paywalls go up. Um, So from the standpoint of, yeah, if you want to read an article on the Wall Street Journal, um, you may see it on Facebook, but when you click there, if you're not paying, you're not seeing it. And Mm -hmm. so I think um, with blockchain and things like that, more and more of it will be able to go to the creator because you know, there's not that much cost to do that. So I think what you're going to what you're going to see with that is that whatever platforms give the most to the creator are going to get the most creators. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I think it's going to slowly change from you know the free model to a paid model. And it, it always was that in uh, in Asia. You know, China is uh, there's more people in China listening to English podcasts than there are in the United States and they routinely do you know the micro donations you know where you know whatever it is give a buck for a podcast interview and that's going to go a lot further than say just trying to sell you know your listeners to audible interesting and it, it actually reminds me we mentioned Tim Ferry already during the podcast and he did a, some sort of a test a few years back which he said that he's not going to um, use any sponsorships in his podcast and he opened like a patreon page and he gave this test a shot like only for like two or three months and at the end he concluded that it wasn't it didn't make sense on his end and actually he he said that many of his um, readers says that they actually enjoyed his recommendations and the sponsorships and they would like to keep on hearing them but I guess Tim Ferriss is very unique in, in this way because people actually believe in what he's suggesting yes I think the other one that's going to be interesting is there's mm-hmm. a lot of platforms now that are telling you that they'll host you for free mm-hmm. and it sounds great right oh I can save ten dollars a month mm-hmm. but what they're not telling people is that you can't move the content off the mm-hmm. once you're there and they reserve the right to put ads in there mm. of their cho- of their choosing and I'm not sure if there's a revenue share on it but they get the the vast majority of that so I think what they're doing is it's almost like uh, venture capital right mm. out of out of one of these podcasts one of them is going to hit it big and that's the one we'll advertise on and mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine you know having a podcast that really takes off and then all of a sudden somebody else has the rights to advertise on your podcast you can't go anywhere it's almost like the old model with uh, with social media right mm-hmm. everything's free but they're going to advertise to you and your listeners so I think it's going to be a, a very interesting time here and especially with some of the uh, uh, antitrust things that are going on Going on in the US uh, it should be interesting to see how this all shakes out really in probably the next 24 months I agree yeah nobody knows no these are crazy times for sure it's very hard <laughs> to predict <laughs> to see what's going to happen it's very hard to tell awesome Tom uh, thank you so much I really appreciate your time and the knowledge that you dropped is there anything that I forgot to ask today or Or is there anything that you would like to to share with the listeners before we say farewell I think I'd just like to share one thing and I said mm-hmm. it earlier what's ordinary to you is amazing to others right mm-hmm. we're blessed to be a blessing right you've learned all of these things so your life is better but also so you can help other people mm-hmm. and I used to say well how am I ever going to help anybody you know from living in southwestern Michigan right we were socially distanced before it was cool but now with the technology out there it's so easy to do that to share what you You know as a host as a guest uh, writing content there's so many people you could help and uh, you know I still say that the biggest problem that we all have is obscurity those people that you could help with your product with your service they gladly pay you money the only problem is they don't know you exist so get out there and uh, help people and let them give the opportunity to to hire you and buy your product awesome you Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much. So where can people uh, find out more about you? You have the books, you have interview Valet, where, which uh, social platform are you mostly uh, posting in? Yeah, most of the time I'm in uh, LinkedIn. I always mm-hmm. joke that, uh, you know, I'm the only Tom Schwab in all of Kalamazoo. You can find me there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll make that uh, special page at interviewvalet.com. with ecom X factor and I'll put that checklist that we talked about I'll put a link to the uh, the video with all of the tips and there's even uh, a copy of my book in there podcast guest profits how to grow your business with the targeted interview strategy I come on podcast to to help people uh, and if you want that book uh, you're more than welcome welcome to that awesome great thank you so much again Tom it's been a lot of pleasure a lot of fun to speak with you and uh, hear about uh, the trends in the in the podcast industry which I also believe it's a great opportunity and it's may, some people maybe think it's it's already too late but it's definitely not too late uh, based on the data and obviously you're in the trenches so you know exactly the numbers so I really appreciate the the inputs and insights that you shared today well, I appreciate you and you know like I said anybody that says doing a podcast is easy has either never done it or never done it well it's just great ones like you that make it look easy awesome great thank you so much Tom hi guys this is your own again just a few more things before you take off 
Number one, if you want to learn more about e-commerce and marketing, make sure you check out our YouTube channel, which is called Ecom X Factor Official. Number two, check out our Facebook group, which is called Ecom X Factor Marketing and E-commerce Mastermind. This is a great place to ask questions and connect with other business owners. And last but not least, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to share it with your friends and colleagues. Plus, leave a review at your favorite podcast app.